and we got together with some guys and played and a pickup game. And this first time Carl steps out there and just total mayhem. <laughs> This is Beyond the Game. My name is Mike Lacey. And as you may be aware, Beyond the Game is trying to get the stories beyond the game. And Mr. Roberts is a famous BYU basketball player, but then later famous in the NBA. He's, he's, uh, are you what, 6'10? 6'10. Yeah. Yeah. And I think famous because it's like the, I just got back from Milwaukee, and I was famous there because I'd played with both Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. That, that was that's how they made me famous. <laughs> oh, Fred, <laughs> what about what? Well, what about what I did? Oh no, no, I was you're famous because you played with those guys. <laughs> but Fred, how long did you play in the NBA? Played, uh, I count thirteen years. And then I played two overseas, so a total of 15 years professional. And the overseas were interspersed in during, after, or My before? first year out of college, I played um, I played in Italy. I came back, and then I went to uh, play 10 years in the NBA. And then after the 10th year, I went to uh, Spain for a year. Really? Then came back and played a couple more Yeah, years. is it true that Steve Trumbo was playing in Spain? Trumbo had a great career over in uh, Spain. Wow, really good career. He was on, and you were teammates, right? At in college, yeah, that's yeah, what I mean. College. In yeah. college, yeah, we were teammates in college. He went over to Spain. He ended up getting on a good team. He actually was able to play as a Spaniard, and he they were on a, a good team. I think they won the European Cup a couple times. They won the Spanish Liga a couple times. Yeah, he had a great great career over there. And I just remember him. He was almost crazier than you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just, yeah, he he pushed the envelope a little bit. <laughs> he, he was so funny. I mean, I love things like the far side. And and Steve Trumbo was always he was the just, far side. He was on the far side all the time. Yeah. And he just saw funny things in everyday life that, you know, once he says so he's right. And that's yeah. really funny. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what it was. Yeah, he, he, well, he, he, you know, we were pretty, our group, except for Ainge and Trumbull, we were pretty straight-laced in a box, fit in a box, but then you got Trumbull and Ainge, and they're both out, they're looking in at that box that we're all at the, in. At you guys that are yeah. being all conformists. They, exactly. So you they guys, were the non-conformists? Non-conformists, absolutely. <laughs> I've told people this, that knowing what I know about Danny Ainge, you can, you can share more. But and I have a great respect for Jim McMahon. I loved Jim McMahon as a teammate, but he was a nonconformist. Yeah, you know. And I, I thought, and I think Steve or Scott Runya said this too. He said, "You know who have very identical personalities are Jim McMahon and, Steve, and Danny Ainge." I said, "Really? Yeah, yeah it's possible. You know, because they." I didn't know Jim as well. One summer I played softball with him, and it was great. You no, know, he. We pulled out. I remember that. You, do, you were I on was that on team, that team, were you? I, was you I remember. I was in center field. You were in right field, and, and Jim right. was in left field. Or something, yeah. We just throw those lasers to, from the fence to the home plate. <laughs> Tag and, them out, man. Yeah. They, I, and, uh, but what I know about um, McMahon, he just, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just going to go out and win games. You know, I don't, and Angel's the same way. He's very smart. What I, the way I see Danny is really, really smart, but bold enough to look, to step outside the box, step outside the norm, and try things that others would be like, oh, afraid to. Yeah, I can't do that. I may, it may not work, and I may, it may look bad. And Danny maybe considered that for half a second, but I, I, what? I'm not gonna think. So like in that. basketball, I remember hearing. He has no conscience, you know. Speaking about yeah. somebody who 
Or maybe they had ice water in their veins. Yeah, I just don't think he ever saw the downside of not being great. Oh. You know, because he, he just only saw the upside of of trying to go for some, it. Go for it. Exactly. Go for it. And uh, he was, again, like I say, he was extremely intelligent. Uh, and he used that to his advantage and he saw things. He had no fear, bold. And he saw, you know, he just knew he, he was going to do what it took to put himself on top of that pedestal. But Fred, it's interesting to think, you know, I mean, you guys, you're talking about your conformist box here and then a couple guys that were nonconformist. But seriously, you guys had a team that was comprised of multiple NBA talents. In fact, you were just saying how your senior year, what was your goal? Oh, what was your goal? Yeah. I had a goal to be have the best, the best field goal percentage in the conference. So I don't, I don't think that was a goal Danny Ainge had. No. Okay. I Why? think it, Danny would, uh, it says it all. You come in the locker room and uh, at, at the end of the game, and Danny would look at the score, uh, box scores, and he'd say, I only took 18 shots. I should have taken 25 at least. He didn't even look at how many he made. Me, I'm looking at, okay, how many did I miss? You know, how many shots did I miss? And I think Danny never considered that. And it, it's really, especially with basketball. You can't think like that. You can't think that, oh, you got to get some shots up, especially if you're the guy that uh, kind of where the ball's supposed to end up with. And you have to be confident, right? Yeah, you got to be confident. If you have a little sliver of doubt, what happens? You just, you know, you're going to say, ah, maybe I can't push this, uh, take this shot, or I'm going to, it's not the layup. And that, that really got into my head. And, and, for, and my senior year, we had a weak team anyway. You know, I look back at the, our, team pitchers and I think we had freshman guards and all of our guards had left the age had left or had left all of our experienced guards had left we brought in these freshmen and um we had a good front line but our our guard line was kind of weak it was young it was young it was weak it wasn't established and uh you know I I think it really was a problem for us for sure well, for sure we weren't very good I remember something that was maybe one of the highlights of my fandom for BYU basketball. And it was that season, you know, where you guys, in fact, if it weren't for a bad call, because I swear that Ralph Sampson hit the ball off the backboard and it was goaltending, should have been goaltending. And that would have gotten you, I think, to the Elite Eight, right? That would have got us to the Final Four. Final Four. That was the Elite Eight. Yes. Yeah, and that that really was a momentum changer. I do remember. I remember that. It was near the end of the game. It was like fifty-two it to was, fifty-one, yeah. and, and we really were leading that game most most of the way until that happened. And and I don't know, if, you know, I I remember exactly what he did. He it, he was so long. It looked like he had hands on both sides on the backboard around the rim, and. I don't know, but uh, I, I couldn't tell you right now if uh, what, what happened. Or, but it looked like, I, I just remember there was a controversy whether or not it should have been goaltending or not. It wasn't called goaltending. It kind of was a big deal. It was a On big, TV, on the re instant replay, it was. It, it, it was goaltending? Yeah. Well, now I'm mad. <laughs> but tell me about the game before that. The game before that was a... a just a You're huge trying game to get for us. into the Elite Eight. Elite Eight, yeah. We're playing Notre Dame. And it was actually, I got, it, it was a rough game for me, actually. Um, I got in early foul trouble. I had two offensive fouls called on jump shots. Really? I, I was shooting a jump shot. And Your elbow hit into the I don't know what happened. I'm just going, what the? What is going on here? And I go up and I think I made the shots. I discounted the shots. Uh, they called offensive foul. Next thing you know, I've got three fouls. And I had a good run in the second half where I, I made some uh, important baskets. But, man, I, I got those early fouls. And I ended up – actually, I'm, I fouled out. Really? So, and they come down to the end of the game. Balance I remember that, that shot. Notre Dame game. You had Kelly Trapuca, right? Kelly Trapuca, John there. Paxson. They, that's uh, right, John Paxson. They, um, they had Tracy Jackson. 
who kite stomped on his head, so knocked him out, so I took him out of the game. <laughs> that was kind of a big play because Tracy Jackson had – he was a professional guy, um, played played in the league for a year or two, uh, and somebody else. But anyhow, you know, yeah, so I was on the bench and I fouled out. It was frustrating. We, uh, Balif and uh, – I think Timo Sarlina hit a big shot. Balif hit a big shot. And then Trapuca just did some incredible shots. That were, I, I thought we win the game. We play great defense. Trapuca, he hits a great shot. Call timeout. We've got eight seconds left. And Ainge, that's when he dribbles down and he makes that finger, uh, finger that roll. That famous finger roll. Famous finger roll. Over Orlando Woolridge. Over Orlando Woolridge. But what I remember, sitting on the bench, and I was directly across from the, where this is happening, a few a series before that, a couple series before that, Ainge, um, it was the exact same shot. Finger roll, goes up, Orlando Woolridge rises up, and he blocks the shot. They call goaltending. Oh. They call it. So we get the basket. End of the game, same shot. Orlando Woolridge goes up, and he short arms it. <laughs> yeah. Because he... He doesn't want to come down to his goaltending, and he just got a goaltending call. So he was hesitant, and the ball goes in, game. Game over. Yeah. Uh, you you watch that uh, replay, and you'll see that that actually but, I mean, happens. When they show that an instant replay, leaving Danny Ainge's hand, and then the ball just pausing, floating so yeah. slowly, and this giant of a man, Orlando Woolridge, raising. Just jump. And he's yeah, and and the fact that he didn't get the ball was what was amazing. Yeah, he gets that ball. I'm, and if I think if he, I think if he went up and got it, then they not they would have called call goaltending probably not. But I, it's in his head. Happened two or three plays before that, maybe four plays, whatever. It was is that interesting? And I'm it, glad it was in that. his brain. Oh man, and UCLA wasn't that the the week or the game before that? So we played, we started out, we played um, it was Princeton our first game. We played Princeton, and that was interesting. I ran into a guy who was on that Princeton team. Uh, I can't remember his first name. Were they still doing those backdoor cuts? You know, <laughs> pass and cut. <laughs> yeah. They had this guy Robinson on that team, and I – and he ended up coaching at Oregon, and then he was uh, went, went back to Milwaukee for a little event, and he was one of the assistant coaches, just happened to be Michelle Obama's brother. Really? Yeah. So he, we talked a little bit, and uh, thought that, well, okay, that's interesting. But anyway, so we play Princeton, and then, yeah, and then we play UCLA, and that was a game where oh, UCLA was just going to run us slow white guys out of the gym. Or he just says, you know, I can't keep up with them. And, uh, boy, we ran them ragged and just destroyed them, really. And um, <laughs> That's when people were really saying this this team you had is is the real deal. Pretty good, yeah. And yeah. age went crazy. Oh, man. Age went crazy because the first, the Princeton game, Danny, um, we had shoot-around practice and Danny's back went out on him. And he was laid up in bed. We didn't know if we'd have him for the Princeton game. We didn't think we would. Um, so that was kind of a, a, a blow. We thought, oh, well, okay, there's our But he guy. made it back. But he played that game. He was a little bit sore and stiff. But uh, fortunately, by the time we played UCLA, he was feeling pretty good. And I think Danny kind of went at that uh, the tournament where he's just going to go for it because this is his chance. You know, he'd been, he, was on, he was a baseball player. As Toronto we, Blue Jays. Toronto Blue Jays. Everybody expected that's where he was going to go, and that's what he was planning on doing and playing baseball, be, having a career in baseball. And he comes out. I think he his love, I, I think he wanted to play basketball. Well, I know he did. Really? He wanted to play basketball, and so he comes Why out. Why was he kind of – he was always saying – no, baseball's what I'm going to do. Was it for he had, health? Or? He had a contract. He did have a contract. He had a contract. He had a, you know, that was already a given. Basketball was, you know. That made, was probably better than the NIL that they have these days, you know. Where, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just was listening to a guy talking about the NIL. 
Oh, <laughs> Can you imagine? It's good. If dream. you had the NIL back when you were playing, oh, we had all of us. Yeah. I mean, do you think he would have stayed, or would you have gone to, you know, UCLA and t- taken the big bucks? Well, if I'd been offered, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not taking the money, but you know, we we played college. We had to turn in our gym shoes after we got, you know, if we wanted a new pair after wearing them for three weeks, and they're all wore out in practice and games. If we wanted a new pair, we had, had to, to turn, turn those in so that they could throw them away <laughs> so we could get a new pair, just so we wouldn't wear them around camp. Who was your equipment manager? Oh, Floyd. It was Floyd sure. for you, too. Absolutely. He was nicer yeah. to football players. Well, it wasn't Floyd. It was Coach Arnold. Oh, really? He says, I don't want to see you guys wearing those uh, really? shoes around campus. And, you know, we'd go. Why pro- not? We'd go. We'd travel all day long and go to. Yeah, why not? Exactly. Because um, we were spoiled. You were spoiled. And we were spoiled, <laughs> obviously. And we'd practice. We'd fly all day. We'd pra- go and practice. And then we'd they'd give us five bucks so we could buy a Big Mac and, <laughs> and go go to bed. <laughs> go and what, and, and walk by the nicest restaurant in town to see the coaches and then the. Uh, <laughs> the ad sitting there eating these nice meals but that's a french restaurant you know exactly or italian or so that's how it was for us but uh i i meant we got last year we got a survey the nba put out a survey and asking of all these different questions about how we're doing now what our careers like how our bodies are all that kind of stuff and then one of the questions was do you feel resentment or do you feel a- about how much money these NBA guys are making now? And I don't, I don't you know, it's just the way it is. It's professional. It's kind of capitalism, that, right? That, yeah, that's the way it is. But yeah. I do feel a little bit cheated for college. Really? Because, seriously, we, we couldn't even go in and practice without having, I, I, don't, I don't know, we couldn't use the gym, we could do it. And so, yeah, I feel like uh, that was a little too tight. That was way too tight. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, and I hear about these guys, even BYU, these guys are making money down there. And back in our day. Back in our day, you know, we we were, in fact, I we was. Worked, we worked during the summertime. Yeah. We got jobs. I worked at Geneva Rock and Geneva yeah. Steel. Yeah. You know, and they were real jobs. I came home. Right. Sweaty and tired and yep. full of coal dust in my ears and <laughs> yes, right. I was in the yeah. coke oven. Yeah, we we all had uh, what do they call that? I don't know what they even call it. Now. Oh yeah, um, I, you know, uh, the <laughs> lung disease. <laughs> no, no, what do they call it? Or, or CTE we with got, brain injury. We all had uh, uh, manual labor jobs, uh, <laughs> construction. Well, like construction yeah. jobs. Wait, Can you believe I couldn't remember what that word was? I've been, my, I've had some contu- concussions. Concussions. Like I was going to say, it might yeah. be CTE. Yeah, my, early, absolutely. Early onset. <laughs> but yeah, we had construction job. We worked during the summer because we had to. And these guys, are, it's a whole different world. I think they're, you know, they're playing basketball year round. And are, it is a whole man, different world. They, I guess they get, they can go on that practice floor. 24 7 anytime they want i guess that's 24 <laughs> 7 <laughs> and then um you know food everything. but you know your your team and those games were as a fan i loved going to those games it was yeah. so fun now i think your brother glenn <clears throat> might have one one up on you oh he's got yeah he's got a couple of oh does he oh sure more more than just yeah. Because I remember, you know, there that when I I forget what year this was. What year did you come into BYU? Came in uh 78. 78. And when did you start as a forward? Uh, the 78. I, yeah, 78. Okay. Yeah. Was Glenn just going out then? He was a senior. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so tough was, year, tough year for him. You know, yeah. Started and played the whole year before. Oh, Fred. Didn't play much his senior year. Really? Didn't play much at all. It was rough. Who took his spot? Durant. Wasn't Devin me. Durant? Yeah, it wasn't me. It was Durant. <laughs> <laughs> I took Keith Rice's spot. <laughs> <laughs> and I I love Fred Roberts because I have a son who's playing basketball right now at Southern Virginia. Luke is he says he's only six six, but I swear. When I stand underneath this tall young man of mine, this son, he has to be six seven. But anyway, 
Fred and Glenn are not Fred, Fred and my son, Luke played together. You were, you were a mentor and a coach to him in a way that I just loved. He still needs that feather touch. I think he's trying to get the, the, uh, Highest field goal percentage. No. <laughs> <laughs> you tell him, do not follow that. Come on. Fred's going to show you the feather touch That's of a three-pointer. Yeah. Anyway, was, thank you. That for, was a great year for me. I, I, that was really uh, kind of, I don't know. It, it was really great to be able to go over there and work with Luke. Luke's is a, what a great kid, great boy. and You wouldn't believe uh, how strong he's gotten. Oh, I, I, when he comes back this summer, we got to get together. I bet he is. Get you he, guys on the court. put a whooping on me, I'm Well, sure. I don't know about that, but... Oh. Now, I did meet a guy that said he'd put a whooping on you. Blake. Carl Malone. <laughs> Carl Malone. So he's working out, and he when he works out, he's intense. I worried, like, man, if I interrupt him during this workout... <laughs> he might he drop he a might weight on you. <laughs> I mean... His waist is still like this. And he's built like Adonis, oh. you know, but the friendliest guy in the world. And he said the nicest things about you until I s talked about competition. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, let me ask me about competition against him. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that guy was not gentle. Tell me about it. He was not gentle. Were why? you playing with, with um, the, why do I want to say Atakempo? Were you playing with the 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 Bucks? Both. Uh, well, I started uh, Carl's rookie season. I was in Utah. Oh, okay. I was with Utah, and so we uh, we were teammates together. Um, I that the year before he came, I had a, a pretty good year with the Jazz, and we went in the playoffs, and I had uh, great numbers in the playoffs, and I felt like. Oh, I think I finally you, yeah, played my team it. because I was in Italy, then I went to San Antonio, then I came to Utah, and just kind of hadn't settled. And I thought, okay, I got my team now. And then they draft this kid, this uh, 15th player picked in the draft, Carl Malone. Well, well, the Louisiana Tech, I don't know what that is. I don't know anything about this. Malone, I wonder if he's uh, Moses Malone's cousin or something. <laughs> yeah. I never heard of this guy. And uh, I thought, I got it made. I got it made, and and but and a couple of times he comes into town. His birthday is on the twenty fourth of July. Twenty fourth oh, so of it's July. It's a holiday in Utah. So <laughs> he comes to town. They get us. They get a couple of us guys to be on the Utah Jazz float. And when I was in town, I live here. I'm from here, Pace Manion, and Carmelo. They come in, and uh, you, you know how Utah is. They just love their. They're crazy about oh, their Utah Jazz. A parade jazz. and yeah. a parade uh, and the and Jazz. They and, love and the Jazz. And they're excited about this Carl Malone. It didn't matter. They not, Nobody knew him, but they're just like, and then you see him and say, whoa, he's kind of impressive looking. And um, I just remember I, it was my first um, feeling that, wow, this kid, I don't know. Maybe I'm not as as secure as I thought I was because he, they were, he and Frank Lading were sitting on the front of this float and Frank's got Carl's hand up like this and they're going down stage three. Happy birthday. <laughs> and Carl, we, Pace and I said, Carl, can you believe they throw this parade for you on your birthday? And he, I don't know, I don't know if he ever believed it and I hope, I, you know, I don't, he might hold it against me, but, you know, we were saying, oh, well, look what they're doing for this guy on his birthday and so we kind of had fun with that but I, it was a, he it was a grand welcoming and then the first time we played we went we'd go up to the university of Utah. i had this gym and we got together with some guys and played and a pickup game and this first time carl steps out there and just total mayhem <laughs> just destroyed us i mean there were guys laying down over here guys with ice packs on their face here and shoulders and, and he's saying let's go some more and carl just says just kind of walked off and says, taking this serious, boys. So I'm not, I'm here, and I'm for real. And he was for real. He come in, and, man, he made himself known right away. And so it was kind of a rough year for me because uh, I didn't play near as much as I expected to play. And I was, you know, kind of, uh, it, it was a rough year. Because also during that year, I think it was the next year, maybe, I, I, I came in and we worked out of the same place. And uh, I, I'd worked out with the weights more than I ever have, and I was bench pressing. I just 
210 pounds. 284 pounds. <laughs> or 83. I don't know. It was, and I just, oh, I give everything I had to do 283. And that's a pretty good weight. Sure. Put it back on the rack. Carl walks in and he's, hey, friend. Hey, Carl. He says, are you done there? And I said, yes, I am done. I said, you want me to help you take off the uh, take the weights off? No, that's all right. He just warmed up with my max <laughs> that I'd ever, the biggest max I'd ever done in my life, and he's just warming up. Oh, well, I guess um, I'm not going to win this battle at the weights. <laughs> I better learn how to shoot. It's that feather touch. Man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, oh. But Carl just. He came in and he was not going to settle for just being mediocre. Was John Stockton there at that, that time? Stockton was there, yeah. So Stockton and I, that, that first year I was there was Stockton's rookie year, then the next year was Malone's rookie year, and okay. I was there those two years. Wow. So that's some great basketball. That, that's some great basketball, and that's two guys who, gosh, I, I – Wish I had another couple of years with them because they talk about professional and talk about being prepared to be the very best you can be. That's those two guys. They did everything in their power. When I was watching Carl Malone work out in our gym up there, I said, man, because, I mean, I, I like to work out. I like to feel like I'm in, in shape. But he, and I looked at him and said, because I didn't know who it was at first, you know. And he was built like a younger man. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, and then he's doing this workout with just intense. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, he still takes life that way. He he, uh, he is a very serious. Dedicated. Dedicated. And you know, yeah. something that really was impressive, he had the nicest words in the world for you. And then I said, because there was there had just been a big, heavy snowstorm that had fallen. And I looked down and I said, well, and he insisted that I call him Carl. You know, he didn't want me to call him Mr. Malone or any of that stuff. And he said, no, I'm Carl. I said, well, Carl, if I had a place in Louisiana right now and I got to choose between it and here because of all this snow, I might choose Louisiana. And what was cool about him, he says, you know what? My wife and I consider this home. We love it here. And and it was so impressive to yeah. hear him because he could live wherever he wants, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. And he's, he is he's a special human, no question about it, in many ways. You know, I just he totally dedicated playing twenty years at the level he played and the physicality that he played is is impressive by itself. And then um just to continue on in his business you know, yeah he is a serious businessman he's not you can tell yeah it's not fun and game he enjoys it of course but sure. it's not fun and games he's not letting, he's serious about yeah, yeah go ahead and put my name on that billboard you guys go out there and make me some money no he is involved he's, he's involved he's an impressive person well he said the same thing about you well his standards are not as high as mine and so, you know, for me to say he's impressive, I put as a very high standard. For him to say I'm impressive, he has low standards. <laughs> now you stop that. <laughs> I heard you tell a story about a famous NBA guy now, but this was several years ago. And it was Giannis Atakempo. And, uh, you know, he's, he's obviously pretty famous now. But do you remember when you, you know, it was one of his first, it was his first season in Milwaukee. Now, before we talk about him, why why are you so connected with Milwaukee, and why do they like you so much that you've got more more swag from Milwaukee than from anybody? You're always, you know, rocking that that Milwaukee swag. Yeah. Well, I had my best years in Milwaukee. Yeah, we lived there ten years. Played, Penny, fought, did you raise your family there? Raised, for 10 years, we were there with our kids and everything. And the, the, those 10 years, in the five years, a lot of guys, um, during the season, they're there. Uh, summer, they go to their homes, wherever they are. I mean, wherever they live somewhere else. They most, let me see, did anybody stay in Milwaukee? I don't think anybody 
stayed in Milwaukee. Mm. I always stayed in Milwaukee. Really? So I kind of developed the connection with the um, with the organization, with the city, with the state. Um, I really loved it there, and I still do I love it there. And I think that's probably why. And then, so when I left, when I wasn't on the team anymore, I still had that connection with the organization, um, and there, and uh, that helped me for sure. Um, and now they, they are starting to try, they're trying to bring in more uh, former players because it just, I, I it, it kind of helps. It's only good. Yeah. So it, it, to it, remember a little bit of the past. Exactly. And the communities that it's a great sports town. They remember the people who played there. They were, they all have a, an affinity for that time in their life. You know, I have this, I uh, went, I was there over the weekend and, Said, so, oh yeah, I, this is my son, and I was his age when I got to watch you. Wow! And so they have that kind of feeling connection for with the connections. I had uh, one lady come up to me. She says, "I went to school with Ricky, and I, I was in the elementary with your son Ricky." And I thought, "Wow, wow, that's kind of cool." And so they, they there's just it's really a good thing that turns out for these uh, teams to bring back some of the older players because that connection. Yeah, it's fun for someone like me. I'm, I'm more of a fan, you know, after I'm done with football. And uh, and I knew that the Milwaukee Bucks were coming to town. We lived in Sacramento, California. Right, yeah. you know, Diana and I were raising our family. And um, I don't know how we got connected. We still had each other's phone number. You may have called me or I may have called you. I don't remember how. But I think you said, yeah, all those guys are going up to Reno. They're going to go gambling. I'm not into that life. Let's let's hang out together a little bit or something that you had some time. Yeah, like right. it was a day or two before the game, yep. and you just had time in Northern California. And you came, and I still have your jersey that you shared with me. You shared with me a Milwaukee Bucks jersey that I wore proudly. I do not know how that happened because yeah. they didn't give us any gear. <laughs> Floyd Johnson was still I, yeah, controlling I, the... I don't know how that happened. I, I have to check to see if I even have a, a jersey. You, you probably didn't even wear anything in that next game. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. But, yeah, and that was before cell phones and stuff. If we had a cell phone, it had been easy to connect with each other, but it, right. it, it took some work to get connected. I didn't know you were in Sacramento, and yeah. somehow we got connected and was able to go to your home. and uh, That was so fun your family. Us. Yeah, it was great. But you, I love the story you told. Here now you're an alumni, uh, or alumna, al yeah, you're an alum of the Milwaukee Bucks, and they have this new kid that they've drafted, and you had some fun stories about him. Well, I just so this guy Yanni, I like to call him Yanni just for fun. I mean, oh, and um, we we pretend because my wife is Greek, we pretend that we have a relationship with Yanni because he's Greek. Because he's Be well, he, he lived, lived in Greek. Greek for yeah, a while. He lived in Greece, Greece. Right, lived in Greece, and um, a story this guy told me. He said. And Yanni was young, and he's the same height as me. But we, I, I've stood next to him, and I, we've reached out our arm, you know, spread eagle arms, and my fingertips come to right here. No, on his arms, and we're the same height. Seriously, that's because I've never thought of you as having short arms. No, so his arms are super long. He is, he is one long dude. But anyway, this guy, um, he. He comes there, and he comes from straight from Greece. These guys, it's a family that I know that when they were in Greece and they played on these teams, he and his brothers, they shared the same shoes. And so they had a life that they didn't know anything different. They didn't know about how special it is. Well, they knew it was special, but um, they just didn't have things, and they come over here. They were used to doing without, right? Doing without. I mean, everything in life. Everything. And he comes over, and that's changed, by the way. <laughs> they, he, he's doing just fine. <laughs> he's okay. He, he got a driver's license. <laughs> he's got his driver's license. But this guy's telling me, he says, yeah, it's, it's before a game, a couple hours before the, the basketball game, and I see this long basketball line. I knew he had to be a basketball player, and he's running down the street. He's got his gym bag, and he's running. I, said, I think that's Jonas Antetokounmpo. 
and he kind of it was like so, miles to the stadium yeah right? it was he was on the other side of town and it comes to stop and the kid was stopped on the corner and he said hey are you going to the arena and he said yeah yeah i gotta get to the arena well i can get you a ride and says i'd love it thanks <laughs> so he gets in he gives this kid a ride to the arena and two years later he's an all-star unbelievable but he he really come from humble circumstances he's so amazing and great for for the league and then especially for that city what he's been able to do for the city and these new owners and what have they been able to do oh, this arena they build it's incredibly beautiful does he still I mean, have that humility that he just portrayed i mean he's very he's humble and he understands that his craft so what happens a lot of these guys they said okay i'm there i'm good well, let's just go play he Sometimes I think he works too hard. He really? gets he's in that gym and he is punishing himself. He he's a Carl Malone type guy, or maybe, um, but he is always working on that craft, and that's the most important thing. And he knows that, and he knows that they have to win games, and knows he has to be prepared. But yeah, he's amazing. I it's so great, and the people love him, and he loves it. He's good to the city. He's, he's devoted to the city willing to do a lot of, a lot of the things that uh, it's fun to hear. make the city better. Yeah. Now you tell me, at least when I played basketball, and maybe it was just the way I played, but my coach always wanted me to pass it to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I had a little bit of that. <laughs> well, when you're the tall guy back in the 1970s and 80s, yeah. I mean, it was that the tall guy doesn't dribble. No. Right? And they... It, it was like you and I was fast, and so once I got a, I sometimes I got a rebound and yeah. I started going, yeah. and I beat the rest of the guys. I can do a layup, coach. Yeah. Don't get mad at me for dribbling. Think about those coaches, how they were. Talk about being locked into a box. Yes, it didn't matter how athletic you were. You're a tall guy. You're not dribbling the ball. You're not getting. Don't what are you, you doing out there, dribble. You get it down in there. You pass it to Steve yeah, Craig. You got Steve Craig exactly. <laughs> Let him shoot those three pointers. You go get a rebound. It's like maybe Kevin McKelly one time in the middle of practice, and we got this where he's supposed to down pick on for Ainge, and McKell was not making the pick. He was the guy was getting around him. Yeah, it was just enough so Ainge could get the pass, uh, but he wasn't open. And Casey say, Kevin, set a good pick. Get the get him open for a shot. Casey, why would I want to get him open for a shot out there when I'm gonna get when I can, I'm gonna score at will down here in the post? I don't want him to be open. I want him to be covered so he'll throw me the ball. <laughs> and he's doing this right in the middle of practice. Kevin McHale. <laughs> yeah, Kevin McHale is just, Oh boy, there went that practice. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it in, boys. <laughs> in the NBA, well, in professional sports, the coaches don't have as much yeah. leverage over and you they as... Di- and they did then. Now, oh, you know, really? Much more then, uh-huh. but not with Kevin McHale. <laughs> but Kevin McHale is just going to say, nah, I'm not doing. I'm not going to set a pitch for, pick for Ainge. If he gets open, he's going to shoot it. How about I, for Bird? Would he... <laughs> um, you know, Bird, they both had... He had the other block. Okay. They were just an intrusible. But he says... No, I'm not. I, I don't want him getting open so he can shoot the ball. I want. I need to shoot. Coach. Yeah, it's going to be me. But back to the big guys and not dribbling. What would it be like if you yeah. had the freedom first to even practice yeah. right. a behind the back or you know, and then to go all the way down court? I look at Giannis and these. Who's our guy at Denver? Who's so big well, and the Jokic? Yo- kick, yeah. yeah. Well, he's spectacular. This game has changed. To- totally changed. If you, there are so few guys who are seven foot or six ten, six seven foot, who cannot, they can't, sh- who don't shoot the three and don't shoot perimeter shots, who c- are still in the league. You look at uh, marketing up here, in Utah. That's right. He's fantastic and just a, an incredible shooter. Fred, what what other stories would you like to share with us? Oh, uh, let's see. What's a fun one? I, you know, what, one thing for sure, it, it was a great opportunity for for me to play with Ainge and Kite in Boston. That was so great, and you know, have that relationship. Kite, I um, 
to, to stay connect, stay connected with him, uh, to have that experience. We played for the, we didn't win, they won the championship. When I was there, we just played for the championship. And so Who I, did I, you lose to? We lost to the Lakers. Boy, those were yeah. games. They, Celtics versus the Lakers. The Celtics versus the Lakers. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, the Celtics had definitely extended my career to be on that team. Um, you know, I, I tell these stories with old, uh, everybody's got a Larry. If, you, if you've been around Larry Bird, you've got some kind of Larry Bird story. That Talk about a guy who was clever, intelligent, and competitive and driven. I'll never forget. He's Rick Carlisle and I. We'd play one on one before every practice. We'd be out there maybe before and after. And Larry, one day, he stood over in the corner watching us play one on one and said, "You guys are terrible." So, what do you mean? He says, "Oh, hi. He says, you're terrible. I think I could beat you both. <laughs> one no, on you, two. No, you can't." He says, "I think I can beat you." Well, all right, let's go. And he says, I'm going to bet money. I'm going to bet $5 I can beat you. And so we, and you guys will bet $5 each. And all right, we'll take this bet. And he says, I'll tell you one other thing. I don't, I'm not going to dribble the ball. He says, I'm just, no dribble. Wait just a minute. He says, you're not going to dribble the ball against two, the, us. That's right. And so, we, you know, it kind of looks silly when two guys are out there guarding one guy and so we now kinda, Larry Bird, six eight. He's six nine, six he's ten. Six nine, six ten. Yeah. And Rick Carlisle. Carlisle's about six four, six five. I okay. think. And I'm six ten. And, You're right. Um, so uh, we give him the ball, no dribble. So, but just again, his famous fadeaway yeah, jumper. Again, we can't look like we're too serious about this because. <laughs> It's uh, one on two. 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 Yeah, one on two, and he doesn't get a dribble ball, so we're kind of up there getting a hand on. Wham! He makes the first shot. We're playing the five baskets. Okay, all right. We expect him. He's going to make one, and he gets to make it, take it. So he gets the ball again, and we're saying, look, and wham! He makes the second shot. We're down two zero. <laughs> I says, Rick, if he may, if he beats us, we're going to be cut today. We'll be, we will not be on this team after today. We've got to, and if he gets a shot off, it's going to go in. So we got to get a hand on the ball. So we did. We ended up winning that game five to three. Really? <laughs> we win five to three. And he owes me five bucks. And he still owes you five bucks. He owes me five bucks. That's, That's a good dirty debt. Dog. You know, and when you think about all that time and the, right. the time yeah. value of money, I, know. I think you've got a you've got a I've call. got a case, don't I? You do. <laughs> I've you, got a case. Larry he Bird. didn't offer. He's the one that offered the five buck uh, bet. That's right. Well, the other story I love with Larry is um, we were in the, in the playoffs playing Milwaukee in Milwaukee, and you're and you're with Milwaukee I'm now. With, I'm with Boston. Okay, still with Boston. We had some oh we had some battles against Milwaukee, and he's sitting here. We're getting ready for the. Uh, getting our shoes and gear on to play in the locker room and he's sitting here i'm here and he kind of hey larry you know you only talk to him if he talks to you at least that's was what i was allowed i was allowed i knew that my place was if he if he talks to you then yeah, you're free then i'm free to say something if you know within yes that, king larry yes within the, the parameters and he looked at me and he says and i was nervous i went it's a big game and he said well oh so what do you think about for these games friend oh i get to show larry that i'm serious about this and i've you know been thinking about it. he says so well i like you know when we had shoot around today i think about the game plan i think about the guy i'm gonna be playing his tendencies and uh what offensive what we're gonna do and he he says well, that's good Go ahead. Well, I, I I braved it. I took a risk and I said, "How about you?" I said, "Well, what do you think about Larry?" <sighs> well, I think about how scared those guys in the other locker room must be to have to play against me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, you know, I've been in that other locker room. They we There's they were they are scared. <laughs> 
I love that. Yeah, he was great, and he just he enjoyed playing. He enjoyed the competition. The the harder guys played against, and the more the tougher it was. This is what I, my feeling was with him. The tougher it was, the more he liked it. Fred, <clears throat> your history, your career, and this young man. I'm sure he doesn't have to, but he still has a passion for for teaching. And so today, you were out teaching, what, 7th graders? Got 7th uh, grade classes and 8th grade classes. You have to have a special kind of heart Well, I'll to, you, to do that. I would tell you this. I, I you know, I'm getting better, um, and, and I do enjoy it. It's, it's just, it is nice to... Get over there, be around the kids. I, I, the kids are great. Oh, I just, I, I have enjoyed it. I've been very lucky. I'm glad that I've been able to do it, and I hope I continue to be able to do We're it. We're proud of you, Fred. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for your years at BYU, even though it wasn't oh, easy. Yeah. Thank you for what you did in the NBA, and now what you're doing. Well, he even coached, or not coached, but, but taught my granddaughter. Oh, well, that's right. Sure. And, uh, she she'd be a handful little natalie yeah, yeah. i love that yeah, thank you fred great fred it's so good to have fred here well, go bucks you. go bucks go cougs go I cougs guess. yeah all right cool thank you mike thank you fred Bye.